Science textbooks are in a bit of a pickle. Math books always want us to find their X. Ancient history doesn't change that much because it's ancient. And even old literature can teach us timeless lessons. Like make friends with the quiet kids so you don't get stabbed, or people can do really dumb stuff when they want to impress their crush. And that bacon is highly overrated. But the older that science textbooks get, the more laughably outdated they become. Take a look at a science textbook from the 1950s and you might see a periodic table with 100 elements. So today I'm talking about why there might be some flaws with the traditional, here's the book with all the knowledge model of learning science. Because ultimately, this book alone is not the best way to learn science. So what's the point of having a science textbook? It's meant to be used as a reference book, something with equations and diagrams and a list of ideas that teachers can base a curriculum around. The thing is, that book doesn't do a good job of being a book. They're designed to be like a guided walkthrough. The students read it first on their own so that what the teacher says in class makes sense. But once you actually start skimming the pages, you're met with walls of dry and dull text. A strict presentation of the facts. No narrative, no compelling stories, no reason not to put your head down and fall asleep. That is, if you don't rage quit first out of frustration. Many high school science textbooks contain more than 3,000 vocabulary words. That's more than most foreign language books. And it's not just big words, it's advanced writing. Science textbooks are usually written at an instructional reading level, or an IRL, of one to two years above their grade level. But even if you found the holy grail of textbooks, it still wouldn't take away from how boring these books are. For an example, take this difference from Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything and my eighth grader science textbook. Both are about how carbon bond to a wide variety of other atoms. What sets the carbon atom apart is that it is shamelessly promiscuous. It is the party animal of the atomic world, latching on to many other atoms, including itself, and holding tight, forming molecular conga lines of hearty robustness. Take that from Bryson versus the large variety of carbon-based molecules is a result of a carbon atom's ability to form bonds with atoms of many different elements. Clearly, Bryson's narrative is more engaging, and getting these students engaged about science is super important. We need students to want to consume cutting-edge science on their own, especially considering how quickly the information they learn in school becomes outdated. Science class is good for teaching you some basic concepts, but once you get to junior high science, the topics that you're learning are advancing extremely quickly out in the real world. When I was in eighth grade in 2003, the smog problem in Los Angeles was the big deal in our textbook. That would be the big issue my generation would fix with our education. By the way, if you laughed at 13 year old me as a tater tot, make sure to press that like button down below ever so gently. So Los Angeles used to have a terrible smog problem. The pollution from the millions of cars and the dozens of industries in the valley wreaked havoc on people with breathing issues and it even claimed a few lives. When the textbook was written, the air pollution was bad, but by 2003, it was getting much better. I mean, it's Los Angeles, so every day is just terrible, but at least the air was cleaner. So clearly, this was a time where education caused wide-scale change, right? Not quite. The government passed some laws, cars got cleaner or you paid money, and it turns out that making people pay money motivates them to change their behavior pretty well. So educational priorities and societies, and of course the technology available change, but so do predictions and forecasts. They're either wrong or they become reality. For example, back in the early 2000s, some scientists predicted that the human population would grow to 10 billion people in 2010 because we'd continue on this steep population projection. What actually happened was a global population slowdown. The number of people on Earth still grew, but not as quickly as they had feared. And science gets more advanced every day with little tweaks and corrections happening all the time, like with the population trends or forecasts for climate change. So if we can't always count on information in the book, at least we can teach students how to find the right information. Answering that how is a big goal of the next generation science standards, but many teachers find this transition difficult, so they resort back to what they know, teaching from the textbook. And then we're back to square one. So then what is the best way to learn science? Well, it's probably a combination of a bunch of things. A bit of lab work, a bit of reading, a bit of modeling. Nope, not that kind of modeling, that kind. But the best way definitely isn't reading a single book. It needs something else. Remember after all, science is a process, not a product. The best part is actually getting to go out there and do it. Have fun, be good. I'll see you next time. Hey, thank you for watching. If you made it all the way to the end, make sure to leave a like on the video and comment what you think about this science textbook debate. Are they worth it? Are they not worth it? Are you completely tired of my voice? Let me know in the comment section. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs>